Well, um, good evening, everyone, and welcome to uh, Credit Secrets bi-weekly uh, webinar. We're, we're glad you're here. We've got some really uh, uh, great info. You can see uh, Steph there and Erica and John in the background. And uh, Scott, we gave him a day off today. So uh, <laughs> uh, Erica stepped in for him. And um, so we've got some really exciting stuff for you tonight. Uh, there's two things here that we want to share with you that are extremely powerful. They're actually not in the book, so you're going to have to take notes. And I would take copious notes if I were you because they're both very, very powerful things that uh, you can incorporate into uh, uh, your credit process. And uh, so, but, but before we did that, I thought I'd take a moment here, and some of you may know this and some of you may not, but um, you know, everybody you're looking at here with, except for John, who's come out of the industry as an expert with Equifax and my FICO, we were all customers, just like you guys. You know, we had our own credit challenges and the entire team behind the scenes here, for the most part, um, have all come uh, to work on this side um, because we kind of mastered uh, the process and uh, we kind of matched certain criteria for the jobs at hand. And so, you know, the whole program grew so fast that, you know, we, we were constantly uh, looking to add somebody here and there to our team who we think is a good fit. And I will tell you, for us to consider them to come to this team, they're going to have to bring their A game. They're going to have to be full on. They're going to have to be really good at what they do. And, and so that consideration came up here a while back. And most of you, I don't think, are surprised by it because she's a rock star. She's brilliant. And so we want to welcome uh, our own Jen Cartwright to the team. Yay, Jen! Yay. Thank you, Jen. Yay. Good to have you, Jen. You guys should be clapping out there. Uh, Jen <laughs> comes to us. Um, uh, she was a clerk in a in a in a court. Uh, she was also a, in a in, a, in a, a, ju a judicial court, state court, and she was also a clerk in a federal bankruptcy court. And believe me, she's added a tremendous amount of value and information to us. And uh, we, we've become a real power to be reckoned with here when it comes to all that. So, uh, as you know, uh, you know, removing public filings it can be very challenging. It's probably the hardest part of this. And we've been very, very successful. When I started this, I had four public filings uh, on, on each bureau and I was able to remove all of them. So uh, it's great to have Jen. And the other one thing I'll say about Jen is she's an incredible researcher. Uh, she can find law, case law, and she's uh, she's already helped us immensely. So we're really, really great, grateful to have her and thankful, and she's adding a lot of value to our team. So with that said, um, I thought I'd just kind of jump into the first part of this, and that is, um, you know, kind of a motivational side, if you will, and something that some of you might have missed doing this. And if you have, I'm going to highly encourage you to do this because it'll be it'll help thrust you forward when you want to quit, you want to give up when you're frustrated, when you're angry, when you're mad, when you're all those things. And so for me, when I got started, I knew, and this was only really because I worked in Tony Robbins' world, a motivational speaker, but I learned a long time ago that if your why is big enough, the how will show up. And that certainly worked for me. And so when I got here, I wrote down a why. Why am I doing this? What's the upside to this? What's gonna happen to my family? What, what could happen to me in my business? What can, how much is my life going to change if I totally take my, my credit back away from these guys. And so I, I literally wrote a why so strong that, you know, it, 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 it put tears in my eyes. And so I will tell you guys, uh, by the way, uh, Steph's got the page there, but if you look at the page there on the screen, on the left-hand side where all those uh, names are of different things, where it says files and, and all that, there's a section there that calls search this group. And I think, um, uh, Steph's going to put, there he is right there. So if you guys look at it, you can write pretty much anything you want right there. Like you could put Dave Albin and everything I've ever posted will come up when you put my name there. So my pin post, you know, if you want to see the cash uh, to delete letter, if you want to see a cease and desist letter, if you want to see a copy of the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, the Fair Collection Reporting Act, you know, anything, uh, the debt collector back off letter, whatever I posted, if you put it in there, and there you go, Steph's showing it right there. So pages um, and pages and pages and pages, pages and pages and pages of, of stuff there. And I would highly encourage you to go through that. You don't have to read the stuff where I've responded to people, but you know, you'll find and like let's say maybe it's not Dave Albin, maybe it's uh um student loans, 
Uh, maybe it's uh, mortgages, maybe, you know, whatever it is, just type it in there, you guys. And it's a huge, huge tool for you guys. And I highly encourage you to use it. One of the, one of my posts in there is in there. It literally talks about, you know, the, the, the mistakes that a lot of people make and, you know, don't make these mistakes. Don't be one of them. And, you know, right in there is, is the why, because it's a huge part of this. And again, it, it will, it'll keep you going um uh you know and times when times get tough and it, it is it's going to get tough on you i mean it just is it's just part of the process and if you can overcome that and move forward uh with it just because you're wise strong it, it works really really well so with that said i thought i would start into um and i don't know if we can bring in jen later but uh if we can great if not i'll talk about it as well but all right one of the first things i want to talk about is um a notary presentment and what is a notary presentment well a notary presentment can be so for example let's say that i want to settle with one of my one of my debts a creditor or a debt collector and i'm going to get send them a cash to delete letter so as you know sometimes we don't want to give signatures right we don't want to give the opposition our signature because they will definitely use it against us so what you could do is you can go to a notary and you can ask the notary and tell them look here's what i'm doing i want to send a letter um uh to uh an organization and i'm going to create an affidavit and the affidavit um uh, you could actually use two notaries if you wanted to you could you could create the affidavit that says um uh that you know you are who you say you are let me back up Let, let's get into because i know sometimes the credit bureaus push back on our admin updates so they're questioning you or whatever. You can literally go take that letter, turn it into an affidavit, have it notarized by um, a notary that you are who you say you are by showing sufficient ID. You don't have to sign the letter. The notary is confirming that you are who you say you are based on the um, identification that you've given them and that they will sign and create the affidavit that you are who you say you are. And then that way, when you set it to the... Um, uh, credit bureaus um, it, it's a very powerful way of them they can't back out of that they're not going to challenge a notary um, they're just not that that would be completely insane so it's really hard for them to push back especially when you've got a certified letter and then if you send that to them and they don't do it and you or you sent your first letter then you send a notarized confirmation of what you're demanding that they do then you can call back and say hey i sent you a first letter then i sent you a second letter that was done by a notary and, and I have certified copy here, by the way, return receipt that says you got it on such and such a date. So that way, when you're calling them, you've got some leverage. So that's one way to use a notary. Another way to use a notary is what I call a notary presentment. So basically what I can do is I can go, and by the way, we're gonna put up a link. You'll have to double check your state notary laws. But in the state of North Carolina, I can take a check uh, on the cash to delete and I can create that letter, that affidavit or, and or that contract in and around the notary. And basically what the notary is gonna say that on such and such a date, Dave Albin came to me with this information and is making you the following offer on an alleged debt known as account number, blah, blah, blah. If you cash that check, the following contract applies. Uh, I, as a notary, believe that I'm duty bound uh to present this based on mr albin's uh request so basically what the notary is telling them here's the check and if you cash it um here's the terms you're going to have to remove all negative information on my credit bureaus you're going to have to notify the creditor that this a debt is settled and paid in full and can never you can never come back on me again you can't resell it to another debt collector uh, in addition, uh, uh, you know, if you wanted to, you could even, if you had them up against the ropes, which is something I'll talk about in a minute with the bond, uh, you could even ask them for compensation. But it basically, if it's on a cash to delete letter, it's just going to say, if you cast this check, it's a contract. By the way, if you violate this contract, you owe me a $1,000 uh, or whatever you want to create uh, as a... Um, uh, so in other words, you better not cash that check unless you agree to the terms of this contract. Because as soon as you cash it, if you don't remove that information on my credit report, uh, um, I'm going to fine you, you know, $1,000 and, um, you know, you give up your right 
of arbitration and you give up any legal rights. So you, you can literally write the contract that way. Um, there's a, uh, I'll think of in a minute, there's an actual word for that. A con, a conf, uh, what's it? Maybe John knows a confession of judgment. I believe it's called a confession of judgment, which means that, no, you can't argue it. I'm going to take it into court. I'm going to put it in front of a judge. The judge is going to read it and go, well, did you cast the check? Did you read this? It came from a notary. What part of this did you understand, Mr. Debt Collector? And so you're going to have them in a position where it would be very, very difficult for them not to comply. Now, does that mean 100% that they won't honor it? Well, come on, these are not honorable people, so we don't know exactly what they're going to do. But at the end of the day, uh, if they cast that check and read that, it's probably a really good possibility that um, they'll remove it from your credit report. So, and we so, already know so, by those that have posted on the Facebook page that uh, it has actually worked already several times. Right. So, so, so Dave, that um, that notary link you're talking about, uh, yeah. Jen just sent us an email with it. So I'm going to put it in the Facebook group here. OK, so great. Know what you're talking about. Right. Um, so that's that's a good thing. That's a good resource. Cool. Yeah. And so I'm just going to kind of move that right into the bond thing. So when okay. Jen got here, Jen's a researcher, right? She is vicious. She wanted to know everything about the laws and how they pertain and how it works and so on. Again, she worked in the court system. So that was, you know, that was her thing. So she found out that in the state of Texas, and by the way, there's this also applies in many other states. And we'll put up a link where you can actually click on that link, put in your state and find out what the requirements are for a debt collector to do business in your state. So Jen found out that you have to be bonded in her state. Well, she found out that the debt collector was not bonded. Well, you can only imagine, Jen, she was salivating. So she took that information and she started, you know, what, we, what do we say when we used to play hide and seek, ollie ollie in free? Well, the guys were trying to hide and they couldn't hide. So that's when you start squealing like a stuffed pig. You notify the Better Business Bureau, you notify the Attorney General, not only in their state where they're doing in Texas, but you can notify the Attorney General in, 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 a, in a state where the debt collector is as well. Um, and then you can, and if you find out that they're not bonded, by the way, let me back up, you do the CFPB, the Better Business Bureau, and the Attorney General in your state, and the Attorney General where the, um, um, maybe, maybe the debt collector is in another state, but they still have to be bonded in the state of Texas, even though they're in Oklahoma. It doesn't make any difference. Now, the other thing that, that, that what that does is that if that's a debt collector and they violate that, that pulls in the creditor too, right? Think about this, because the creditor hired them or sold the debt to them and went after the collection. So that doesn't make the, the, the creditor immune from the, the violation, the state and or federal violation there that, that, that they have, um, you know, the actual offense itself. So, uh, one of our members here used this here not too long ago, the same bond, and that debt collector went, uh-oh, we're in trouble, and came back and made this uh, young man an offer. And if I remember right, Jen would probably remember, but I think they offered him like $1,300 to um, go away and basically said, here, you're going to sign a gag order. We're going to pay you $1,300. bucks. we are going to remove it off your credit. It'll never come back. Um, and, it, and it worked out beautifully. So... A little research up front about the debt collector, you'll find that these get, look, they're not honorable. Um, you know, I think, was it uh, on Shark Tank? Uh, uh, it was Mr. Wonderful that, that says all the time, when you find that out, you're going to crush them like the cockroach that they are. And that's exactly what that does. So again, you're going to have a link. There it is. Um, and you, there's the notary link there that you can see. And then we'll put up another link there for you guys. It'll show you. You can click on it. Go, into, go to your state. Put what state you're from, and it'll tell you what the requirements are. Are they registered with the State Corporation Commission? Are they registered with the Secretary of State? Do they have their bond in place? These are the things that they have to have. And if you find that they don't have those things, then guess what? You want to evidence them. What do I mean by that? Take a screenshot. Make sure that you have that and document it so that when you go and file your complaints with the BBB and the CFPB and the Attorney General, you want to show them proof. And so you'll have the screenshots and you can show them clearly the evidence is clear that they're in violation of uh, doing business in that in your state uh, and they violated uh, those rules and regulations. Um, and so based on that, anything you want to add to that, John? Oh, I can't. Sorry, I had it on mute. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, I, the way y'all kind of strategically use the law is a little bit different than 
my experience with it. Mine is a much more kind of mainstream legal track in as much as consumers don't go through these kind of preliminary strategies that y'all teach your the, the, the folks in the group to go through. Um, the folks that I generally deal with are so frustrated that they can't get stuff off their credit report or things corrected or whatever their, their case may be that they've kind of thrown up their hands and have chosen to enter the legal system as a plaintiff and have reached out and have either hired an attorney or have retained one on, on um, a contingency basis and then it really depended on the, the work of the attorney to go through and sue the relevant parties and then work through that process, not only in an effort to get the information either removed or corrected on the credit report, which generally happens fairly quickly in that type of lawsuit because the furnisher or the credit bureaus will remove it out of an abundance of caution because they don't know if damages are still occurring. Um, and so it's in their best interest to remove something. But then also try to get some sort of financial award for the consumer, either in the form of a settlement or um, in the form of a jury verdict. Can't hear you, Dave. You, you had posted something earlier today, John, about, if I understood it correctly, correct me if I'm wrong, please, um, an attorney somewhere put you down as an expert witness and yet didn't even notify you? Yeah, I'm actually I'm pretty angry about that. Um, <laughs> yeah, we met. <laughs> there's, a, there's, a, there's actually an official process that you go through to find an expert, retain an expert. There's a process that we as experts have to go through before we allow ourselves to be retained. Um, and when we have to go through conflicts checks, um, we as experts have to decide if we want to even be associated with the lawsuit just from a purely business perspective or from a, I mean, I'm contacted two or three times a week from plaintiff's attorneys who want me to say things that I just have a fundamental disagreement with saying. So I just choose as a matter of principle to, to not take them up on their offers. And so there's an entire well established and recognized process for, um, retaining an expert. There's also a process in kind of the chronology or the, the movement of litigation where there is a date, then that date is the expert disclosure date. And this is all court order. This isn't just something that's randomly assigned. Um, this is, the, the court sets a scheduling order and one of the dates on that scheduling order is the dates that their ex the expert witnesses have to be disclosed. Um, and just for some reason, this, attorney in Irving, Texas, disclosed me as his expert. And I, this happened as far back as April. And I had no clue. I, I know nothing about anything. I was completely blindsided. And, and the attorney for the defendant actually reached out to me today and, and asked me, are you, are you testifying in a trial in Dallas in three weeks? And my initial response was I immediately went to look at my calendar to make sure I didn't screw something up and neglect to schedule a trial in a couple of weeks in wow. Dallas. Um, and so number one, I thought I messed up. When I figured out that, that I didn't mess up, I reached back out to the attorney who contacted me and at, again, out of an abundance of caution, I told him, I said, look, I need you to identify this lawsuit before I have any substantive discussion with you because I didn't know if I was perhaps involved in it. And I just had completely dropped the ball on this thing. And so he responds and sends me the case style, which is basically the name of the plaintiff, the name of the defendant, the jurisdiction. Um, and then I also asked him to include the lawyers that were involved. And I had absolutely no idea what in the world he was talking about. And so I picked up the phone and called him. And I said, I, look, I don't know who you are. I don't know who that other lawyer is. I don't know who these defendants and plaintiffs are. I have no trial on my calendar for this week in Dallas um, or the, the week that he was talking about in Dallas. And I have no plans or intentions of going to any trial in Dallas. I know nothing about everything as far as that. And, and he was like, yeah, we kind of thought that was the case. He's actually disclosed a bunch of experts and we're pretty sure that none of them have been notified. And so what I think, it, what and this is complete speculation on my part, 
but I think what happened is, I think the plaintiff's attorney went out and disclosed a bunch of these experts just to eliminate them from possibility of being hired by the defense attorney. So essentially he's kind of, um, you know, uh, proactively eliminating a swath of expert witnesses in the field so that the other side can't retain them. Because if the guy on the other side had been yeah. smart, he would have immediately yeah. noticed my deposition when he first became aware that I was supposedly an expert. And that would have immediately notified me, hey, look, your, your deposition has been noticed. I you know, usually get a subpoena served with a request for documents and an order by the court to show up at a certain place on a certain day at a certain time. And of course, I never got that either. So I think the defense lawyer kind of dropped the ball a little bit as well by just assuming that all these experts were kind of like, you know, shadow experts, if you will. So I, I actually went out almost immediately after I post after I posted out on the credit secret site, Dave, and I actually posted it on every single other one of the websites where I'm a member to let them know, hey, look, you too may have been disclosed as an expert. Just be aware of that uh, on the off chance that you you know, get some sort of phone call or funny email from a lawyer asking if you're an expert testifying in, in Dallas in a couple of weeks. That's I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm assuming that's a that's a code of conduct violation uh, in direct accordance with their oath of office. Um, well, we're not, this isn't over yet. This isn't over by a long shot. If if someone is disclosing an ex, anybody as an expert, I mean, there's a, th this isn't my first rodeo. I've been, I've been retained hundreds of times and they all go through the same process and so this is the first time that i've ever found out i mean it may have happened in the past and i just didn't find out this is the first time i've ever found out that someone has disclosed me as an expert without actually ever speaking with me about whether or not i wanted to be an expert for their particular lawsuit this is an over by a long shot i know who the lawyer is i've already found his website um and i'm going to figure out if he's doing this and it was just a simple mistake and then no harm no foul or if this was a a conscious effort to eliminate me from for, from consideration uh, for this for the other side to, to retain me, and what's what's even worse in my world, in the expert witness world, um, you know how in the in the consumer credit world, filing bankruptcy, they talk about the scarlet letter and all that baloney. How you have this scarlet letter around your neck for ten years and lenders won't touch you, blah blah blah. In my world, the scarlet letter is. Um, you being excluded as an expert, that's public. So if this guy discloses me and then somehow goes back to the court and says, well, you know, Alzheimer won't respond to us. We can't get him to do his work. We want to go ahead and exclude him, you know, kind of pre proactively and the court files or the judge allows that to happen, then there's now a record, a public record that any lawyer can find that I was excluded as an expert in this particular jurisdiction and I would have no idea that it even happened first place so we're, we're not done with this by a long shot trust me there'll be a follow-up on this one that's crazy yeah i'm i i'm sure you'll be filing grievances with the bar I know, right? <laughs> i mean i'd be on all over there yeah. so right, just a question because i missed i had missed that today but um so the law uh, listed you as a as an expert now, some of these people that are suing the creditors or bureaus on their own and representing themselves the the same uh, the same warning applies, right? I mean, they would they would be able to list anybody as a credit expert, and we don't want them to. Is that uh, what you're saying here? I'm trying to follow yeah. the ball. Yeah. So the 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 plaintiff's expert basically just took it upon himself to file a notice with the court that he had retained me and and disclosed me as an expert. Which okay. Means I, which means for all intents and purposes, I have been drafted by his team and I cannot be drafted by any other team as a result. Mm -hmm. When in reality, he never drafted me on his team. I have no clue who this person is. In the, in the above board ethical world of consumer credit litigation, whether it's an FDCPA lawsuit, an FCRA lawsuit, or some civil litigation that's got some sort of credit damage component like a failed business partnership or a, a bad divorce, um, you know, one side or the other will often reach out to someone like me or other people who, who do what I do and, and, and kind of interview them as to, you know, let me explain a scenario to me and let me know what you think. And if, if your perspective is 
in line with their legal strategy or their thinking, then they may, they may retain you as a credit expert. That's a, that's a pretty big deal. Um, you know, I can sit here all day long and say, I'm a credit expert, I'm a credit expert. And Susie Orman can go on TV and talk about how she's a credit expert, credit expert, and David Bach and Robert Kiyosaki and all those people can talk about how they're credit experts. But when the court says you're an expert on a topic, it takes, it, it's a very different level of um, acknowledgement than just someone saying, oh, I'm a credit expert. And so it, it's a really big deal if you're retained as an expert and eventually are allowed to testify in front of a judge and a jury on the, some topic having to do with consumer credit, which is why people like me are really, really um, protective of this process because we acknowledge and recognize just how big of a deal it is. And we don't like for people to play fast and dirty and loose with the rules, which is why this has gotten me kind of pissed off today. But yes, Erica, you're exactly right. If, if anybody chooses to, to, to sue a credit bureau or a debt collector or a lender, um, and they've either hired a lawyer to do it or they're doing it pro se, then they absolutely can retain an expert. The, the only reason you'd retain an expert is if you feel like the, the expert's opinions are going to be helpful for you, either in terms of trial testimony or in terms of um, settlement negotiations. And, and look, let's be real honest, the overwhelming majority of credit-related lawsuits settle. If you, if you kind of look at it as, as an upside down dunce cap, the, you have this amount of credit related lawsuits that are filed every year. And then you have this percentage that actually one party or the other or both retain an expert. And then about that same amount, you'll have expert reports flying back and forth, kind of dueling expert reports, if you will. And then a slightly smaller percentage where a deposition of one or both of the experts take place. And then a really, really, really small percentage of those that actually see the inside of a courtroom. Normally between the deposition and trial stage, usually that's where the two parties, um, you know, it's almost like playing, uh, you know, hold them poker. At the, when that last card was flipped over, everybody knows what they've got and they know if they've got a good hand or if they've got a lousy hand, whether they've got a bluff or they've got a fold or if they want to put more money in, it's the same way. After the depositions take place of the experts, both sides know um, exactly the, what kind of cards the other side is, is holding. So they know, look, we need to either start getting real serious about settlement discussions because we've got a bad hand or, hey man, we're, we're going to trial because your case sucks. And, and, and your expert is going to get torn apart by my expert or vice versa. And so that's generally how the process works. And look, look, it's not a cheap date. Um, experts are really expensive. There, there are some, I'm, I'm about at the 80th percentile as far as the hourly rate goes, but there are experts in my field who charge as little as 350 an hour for work. And there are some experts in my field, mostly the economists who do kind of the economic component of the work. And some of those guys are charging in excess of $1,000 an hour. And so it's it's not like you're going to Costco to buy a bunch of toilet paper. It, it's, it can be a very expensive um, right. a very expensive proposition to, to retain an expert, which is why um, which is why some lawyers, especially on the plaintiff side, if they're taking a case on contingency, they're paying the, the expert out of their pocket for, for all intents and purposes. And they're hoping that the case settles so that they can recoup those costs. Usually on the defense side, where I do most of my work, you're getting paid by an insurance company is sending you a check because a lot of these companies have coverage for these types of lawsuits, or you're getting a check from a Fortune 500 company or a mega bank, and so you know you're going to get paid. You may go through their super duper slow accounts payable system, but you know you're gonna eventually get paid. And I'm glad you, that you-, you Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I'm glad you brought clarity to the part about, um, uh, you know, it's not cheap to hire a, uh, an expert witness because I can probably hear some of my our members' wheels turning. Hey, I'll file a lawsuit in small claims and I'll ask John to come, you know, and he'll testify and everything will be great. Yeah, well, you better write a check and it better have a lot of heroes to it. And what he didn't tell you is this expense is going to and from. So before you guys go down that road. <laughs> exactly, exactly. It's so be, so we have a, we have over 100 members on the call right now. So if you guys have any questions whatsoever that you want to ask, there's like a question box that you can ask. Me and Erica are going to pick some of the best questions that we have here and read them off um, that you might have for John or Dave. 
I know she has a list of four four or five questions, right? I got a few, yes, yes. Um, we're going to do a softball, a softball to start with. Um, <laughs> Catherine, and we, we've talked about this before, but let's talk about it again. Catherine says that when you remove disputes from your credit reports, will that increase the scores? Recently, mine dropped 30 points because of disputes. How can I fix that? It's actually the opposite. Um, yeah. When you so there's there's different kinds of disputes. So you have the initial dispute, which means that you just mailed a letter to one of the credit bureaus, or you just sent a uh, fax to a credit bureau, or you actually got someone on the phone at a credit bureau and you filed your dispute. There is um, there's actually an initial dispute code that has to be placed on a credit report when you challenge something, and that code is the I'm not sure if you can say that. It's the XB code. That is, um, that's called a compliance condition code, and it's a requirement under the Fair Credit Reporting Act that when you challenge something on your credit report, that the item has to have that XB code associated with it. On the credit report, it reads consumer disputes, reinvestigation, and process, or some reasonable derivative of that phrase. When that code is associated with um, any entry on a credit report, then both FICO and Vantage Scores credit scoring systems will bypass that item for payment history and debt related metrics. And so what, what happens from time to time, I don't wanna say it's common because that's just a theory, but I believe it to be true. Um, if you dispute a bunch of bad stuff on a credit report and all those items have that XB code placed on the item, then your score will very likely go up and it could go up considerably because the scoring system is skipping the negativity and the debt related to those items while the item is being investigated. And I'll tell you, I, I guarantee you at least one of the hundred and some odd people that are watching this right now have just asked why, why, what's, what's the hypothesis behind doing that? And so I'll tell you the answer to the question. When I was at FICO, um, I still remember a discussion I had with our general counsel, a guy named Pete McCorkle. And the discussion was about, you know, why did we choose to bypass certain things on credit reports while they were being investigated by the credit bureaus? I mean, what was the, because that was a choice that FICO made. That's not a credit bureau decision. That's a choice that FICO makes. And the, the answer, which made a whole lot of sense was, look, we're not in the business of adjudicating what's correct and incorrect on a credit report. That's not our job. That's the credit reporting agency's job to make sure that their data is correct and to do these investigations. What we don't want to do is we don't want to unfairly penalize a consumer's score with, by considering something that may or may not be correct. And so we want to stay on the sidelines and wait until that investigation process is done. I'm paraphrasing our conversation now, but this is how it went. We want to wait on the sidelines until the investigation process has been complete and then once the item is no longer actively being investigated, then we'll jump back in the game and we'll consider the item. If the item is gone, obviously it's not there, so we can't consider it. If it's on the credit report and it doesn't have that XB code on it, then we're gonna assume that the item is correct because it has already gone through an investigation process. And so then we will consider the fact that it may be negative and we will consider the fact that it's got a balance associated with it. So what happens normally when you file a dispute and that XB code hits a credit report as your scores go up. And then when the 30 day investigation process is run its course and that XB code is removed because it's only used when the item is actively being investigated. If negative items or items with debt still remain on the credit report in the same way as they uh, were reported beforehand, then your score generally goes back down and corrects. Now, I'll tell, this is not a new credit repair strategy. This has been, this way for decades and there was a time where a credit repair strategy was hey just dispute all your bad stuff your score goes up and you go out and you can get a loan and 30 days later if your score goes down who cares because you already had your loan well that ship has sailed and now banks that see these dispute codes may hold up underwriting thing may try to get a mortgage with dispute codes all of your credit report it, it's not they want that stuff gone and they want the items rectified because they know that there's a possibility that the scores associated with that credit report, while one plus one still equals two, the, the score may not actually be a true reflection of the risk of the consumer because not everything on the report is being considered in full. And so that's, that's kind of the story behind that code. 
Uh, there are other dispute codes that can stay on the credit report indefinitely, but those codes, which are called persistent dispute codes, those codes don't have any sort of influence on credit scores, and so they wouldn't cause the score to go up or go down. Well, cool. All right. Well, and then the other idea behind that is, you know, when you when you if you haven't been doing anything on your credit reports for a while, and all of a sudden you send in all these disputes, that's going to kick in the algorithm, and the algorithm is looking for, and it's doing all those things that algorithms do. And yes, your scores can go down. Uh, we also get, and I'm going to kind of bridge another question that we get that kind of goes along with this, and that is, well, you know, I just paid off this account and my score went down or it didn't do anything. Well, that's when it, where it comes into, look, when anything goes on here and you make changes and you dispute or you pay something off, you've got to give your reports at least 30 to 60 days for them to, um, um, you know, work, work that part out. So, you know, you come in here two days after you paid it off and you want your score to jump 50 points and you wonder why it didn't happen. Come on, guys, it's not going to happen that quick. It's not real time. It's gonna, you're going to have to, you know, let those, uh, let that recalibrate, and and eventually your score will go out. Or what I write on this site all the time, you know, give your scores time to rebound. They will. Got another another question there, Erica. While you're while you're looking at that, Dave or Erica, let me let me just caution you. Nothing on a credit report happens in a vacuum, meaning that. Credit scoring systems don't just look at items in isolation. So one of, the, one of the dangers with looking at the movement of a score is to attribute that movement to something that happened on your credit report that was the most visible thing out of your lens. Um, let, me, let me give you a great example of just how a simple act of applying for a credit card can affect every single component of a general use credit scoring system like FICO and Vanderstore. So you go out and you apply for a, um, a credit card, right? Well, that's one inquiry on one of your credit reports. There's a component of credit scores that evaluate inquiries. Let's say that that account has been approved and activated and reported to all three of the credit reporting agencies. Well, now you've just added a brand new account to all three of your credit reports and that's going to drag down the average age of the accounts on your file. That's another component of credit scores. So now we've talked about inquiries and the time or the time metrics. Those two metrics together are 25% of the points in your score, one fourth of your points. And we're not even done yet. So now let's say that you take that card and you, you know, you charge a very, very modest balance. You know, you fill up your car, you pick up your dry cleaning, Erica goes and buys me some groceries. So now there's a three or $400 balance on the card. Now you just added a card to the credit report that has a balance greater than zero. That it touches the debt metrics. There's also a component of credit scoring systems that considers the mix or the diversity of the different types of accounts on a credit report. And if you're heavy in one area and lacking in another, then that can count a lot. You can, you can forego points because of that. Well, let's say that that credit card is the fifth on your credit report. And so now the balance of revolving accounts relative to installment accounts is getting more out of whack. Well, that's a problem. So now, now we've covered roughly two thirds of the points in your score. And that's assuming that you're paying the card on time. If you miss a payment and a late payment goes on your credit report, now you've touched all five of the components of all general use credit scoring systems. So don't just look at something as simple as an inquiry and think, oh, wait, inquiries are worth 10% of my of score. No big deal if I go out and apply for a credit card because nothing happens in isolation like that. And I can come up with dozens of examples that transcend those different categories. So it just the, on, the only way to accurately attribute a difference in one score to another score is to look at the credit report at both points in time and compare exactly the same credit report data. I mean, you can't, you can't compare TransUnion to Equifax and say, why is my score so different? That's, that's apples to oranges. So you've got to compare the two credit reports from the same bureau at the two points in time, and you have to make sure that the two scores that are calculated are, in fact, the same score. So it's got to be the, the correct generation of FICO compared to the correct generation of FICO. You can't compare Vantage score to FICO or FICO to Vantage score 
or different generations of FICO to other generations of FICO because you're just going to drive yourself crazy and the scores are never going to be the same and you're going to you're, you're going to scratch your, your head raw trying to attribute the difference in score to something that may not actually have any influence over the score at all. So just, just be real careful when you're doing those types of things because you may walk away with a presumption or a conclusion that may not may not actually be correct. Great distinction. Cool. So it really Thank is. You. Oh, before, before, you, before you ask the next question, Erica, so I've seen a lot of questions coming right now. Um, they're in a long, a lot of these are in a long paragraph form. So if you guys can try to keep it like, you know, keep it, just keep it kind of short sure, so, we can read them, so we can read them off. I mean, I know if we, they might have a little bit more detail to it, but if we can get the short and sweet part of it, the question, then we can ask, you know, John and Dave and or myself or Eric, and we can answer that, answer those for you quickly as we can. Because we, we, we're only here for a limited time, you know? <laughs> so if you're reading in there, yes. then the earth cool, if, if you're reading in there, then the earth cooled, it's a little too long. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, uh, so here's another short one. Um, this is uh, someone uh, we had this emailed into us. Uh, when I've sent my part one letter one letters, I didn't pay for the return receipt. The mm -hmm. post office said that I can see who signs for the for the mail by going online, and then I can print that information out if if needed. Um, do you suggest only uh, paying for the return receipt, or is the online printout sufficient? I'll jump on that one. Um, you know, you're either going to get a return receipt that you can walk into a courtroom or you're not. Um, and so when that return receipt goes and that you that the, the, the United States Postal Service delivers it, that person is given the green card. They have to print their name. They have to sign their name and they hand it back to the to the uh, postal carrier. And then the postal carrier delivers it, delivers it back to your address or your P.O. box. That's what you want. So my my backup to that would say follow the book don't yeah. rely upon what a postal carrier tells you I, i'll be honest too when i started using some of the information i didn't use a return receipt all the time but i should have because you, you don't have that that physical hard proof um so it is always best to get a return receipt if you if you can like i said when i first started it was a little bit more expensive because i had a lot of letters to send out um so i, I really didn't wasn't trying to pay three or four dollars to for a return receipt each time but it was beneficial for me to continue to do that. So I do recommend it, I do recommend it. Absolutely, I mean, it's overwhelming and you probably have a lot of letters that you have to send, but, and you may never need them, but if you do have to have it, then you have it. Like like right. Dave said, you have to go to court. Then you have it's it better. With you. Yep. better, I would say better to have it and not need it than to need it and not have it. And okay. I'm the type of guy that I am not gonna walk in that courtroom unprepared. That's just not how I roll. Right. Um, so. And, and you know, and you keep it in a nice file, and and you know what you're doing is you're you're going to your PO box or your mailbox every day, going, where's those green cards? Where's those green cards? And then you're green them, and you know what? It's part of your your staple in them, and you're organizing, and it's just part of the process. So yeah, definitely get the return receipt, no question about it. Don't exactly. try to cut a corner there. Exactly. Thank you, thank you. Um, another quick one, uh, and, and maybe maybe John might know this, or or, or anybody, uh, can you remove uh, a late from a mortgage that was modified? So they've they've had a late a late payment on a mortgage prior to the modification. It's been modified. Can they remove that old late payment? Well, I I mean I'll let Dave or Stefan jump in here, but I suspect mm -hmm. anything can be removed from a credit report. Um, the way that um, the way that there so there are two types of modifications. There are HAMP, which is the government sponsored. Uh, modification program, and then there are homegrown uh, modifications, which is basically just the lender's own policy to modify a loan. If it's a HAMP modification, uh, meaning it's under the Making Home Affordable umbrella of services like HARP, HAMP, and I don't know if the other, I don't know if the other ones are. Um, then there are there are actually prescribed credit reporting uh, processes regarding how to report loans going into the trial payment period of the TPP and then coming out of the trial payment period if the loan has in fact been modified. And I'll, I'll, they're very simple, I'll tell you what they are. If the loan was late going into the trial payment period, which is supposed to only last three months but can last considerably longer, then the lender or servicer is directed to continue to report the account as being late. If that's correct, obviously. 
um, if the loan was not late going into the trial payment period, then the lender is directed to report the accurate status of the account going forward, meaning that if it wasn't late, you wouldn't report them late. If they were not late exiting the trial payment period, then you would continue to not report them as being late. But if they went late sometime in the future, after the loan had been modified or had the, or the modification had been rejected, then obviously you'd report them late. So those are the those are the policies. It, I mean, I'll let Dave or Stefan comment as to the ability or the likelihood of being able to get a, a mortgage late payment removed. Well, you have you have two options there. Obviously, you can try the uh, goodwill letter. Uh, but what you need to understand about the goodwill letter is you're you're verifying the debt yourself. You're saying I missed a payment because, and and we typically always recommend that you send that letter directly to the CEO. And if you need to find out where the CEO is of that company, you're going to have to Google it. Because you want to send it to where that CEO's office is, where he sets his butt every day, his or her butt every day. Um, now, and here's the thing they're looking for. Number one, if you've got a, several late pays, that's probably not going to fly. Uh, and what they're looking for, too, is something catastrophic that happened to you and your family. And if you can document that and you can prove that, then and you maybe have no more than three or four late payments max because of that catastrophic event to your family, then I would say, you know, by all means, you can go for that. But here's the thing. Once you've done that, you can't go back and dispute it with them because you. I'm sorry, that's me. Oh, sorry. So you know what I mean? So you're going to be a double minded person if you do that. So you just want to be very careful there which one you want to do. And as already been said, yes, you can dispute anything on your credit report that uh, you want to. So dispute away. We dropped, we dropped, uh, we dropped the phone. I'm just reading something here that sees. Um, okay. Um, so I, I'm looking oh, at that. that um, if you, what is it? If you have proof from a collection agency that the hospital sent them part of my medical record, can I sue the hospital? Is that one of the questions that came in? Yes. Um, yes. Can you sue the hospital? Well, my answer is you can sue anybody for anything. Question is, can you win? Mm -hmm. Question is, can you state a claim and, and, and prove it? And what I tell folks on the site all the time, look, we're not attorneys. We can't give you legal advice, so don't ask. The only thing I can do is share with you information that I have done in my, some of my own court cases. So, um, and judges don't care what you think you believe. They don't think, they don't care what you, what you think you know. The only thing a judge cares about is what you can prove. And I'm sure uh, John has faced that <laughs> in many a court case. That that's mm -hmm. what the judge is going to look at, you know. And and you got to be able to prove. You got you know you got to state your claim, and you got to be able to prove it, and you got to show the 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 court uh, what the damages are. And you just can't go in there and say they owe me a thousand dollars. No, that's not going to fly. The judge is going to say, well, how is it that they owe you a thousand dollars? Prove to me that they owe a thousand dollars. So I think what that, what that, you know, the, the collection agency here with the, the hospital sent them the medical records. Uh, the question is, if you dispute it, if you dispute the collection agency or the debt collector, and it was a hospital related uh, alleged debt, and they send you proof, what you're, well, a lot of times what happens there is they violate HEPA laws. And if they violate the HEPA law, then now you're dealing with a whole different situation. Now you've got them. Um, and you know you, uh, the HEPA letters in, in in the book, and you can you can notify the original uh, medical provider that that debt collector that you hired uh, violated uh, the laws, which falls back on them as well. The other thing, it also goes back to the other thing: find out if they're bonded, find out if they're you know if they're licensed to do business. Run those, run that on every debt collector uh, that you find. If you um, you know if if you something's being reported on your report as a debt collector. The, one of the first things you can do is go hit that, you know, the, the, uh, the, the tab there and go do the research and find out in your state whether they're bonded, licensed and all that good stuff. Because if you find that and they're not bonded, game's over. I don't care if they hep a lot. We don't care about any of that other stuff. They're done. Stick a fork in them. 
cool. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Sure okay. can. So I had, I had some technical difficulty. One of my laptops died on me, so I'm on my iPad here. And I can't really see the questions right now. So I can see we're coming up on an hour. Um, so if you guys want to take a few more questions, uh, I think maybe two or three more. Um, yep. Erica, do you have them in front of you right well, now? Dave, well, while Dave and Erica are looking at those, I, you know, that's, I get that question a lot, which is kind of, if, John, do I have a case? John, can I sue somebody? And I think what they're doing is they're asking their expert witness a question they should be asking a lawyer because expert witnesses aren't lawyers. And one of the things that we're not allowed to do as experts is we're not allowed to give legal, um, we're not allowed to give um, uh, legal opinions. Meaning I can't say that it is illegal to do this or uh, the defendant broke the law because they did that or that they didn't do that. that that's a very, very fast way to lose your job, your job as an expert because you're not qualified to give legal testimony or to give legal opinions. So that's that's really a question for a lawyer, but I can tell you what the lawyer is likely going to do, which is the first thing that the lawyer is going to do is determine whether or not a law has been broken. And if, you know, just because you're angry at somebody doesn't mean you can sue them because there has to be, so they have to have violated something. Being angry at somebody isn't a violation of the law. So certainly, yes, if someone violated a contract with you, if somebody reported something to the credit bureaus that is wrong and they won't fix it for whatever reason, then certainly there are um, statutes and provisions within statutes that can be allegedly have been broken um, or violated. And that's when, because in every single complaint, which is basically the opening salvo of a lawsuit, um, every single complaint I've ever seen, and I suspect that every single complaint that has ever been filed, um, identifies what law has been broken and what provision of that law has been broken and, and why they are bringing the, that particular action. And so question number one has to go to a lawyer who's qualified to, to practice law in that particular field. Um, otherwise, we're just kind of sitting here speculating and, and you know, having just a kind of theoretical discussion about what, what we think may or may not have been an act that can be sued upon or that can lead to a lawsuit. I've got one. I'm looking at a couple of questions here that I pulled up. Here's, here's one that's, I think it's good. It comes up once in a while. Adding an authorized user like your mom or your dad, can it age your accounts fast? Yes, it can. So that's a, that's a good way. That's the piggyback system. It's also, there's more coverage there. Uh, in in the book, uh, another one here is uh, if I'm an authorized user on an account that's been charged off, and I dispute it, and it's removed, does it come off both account or just mine? I would think it would come. Just going to ask you that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I would think it would just come. You're disputing your report, not someone else's report. So I would think it's only going to come off your. Well, hold on, hold on, Dave. It depends on who you disputed it with. If you if you dispute it with the credit card issuer and they determine that it is wrong, yeah. then the credit card issuer is obligated to carbon copy every credit bureau where they send the information and, and then have it corrected, which would include every single credit reporting agency and likely the primary cardholder. Otherwise, they would be knowingly continuing to report something that's wrong. Because remember, you as an authorized user have no liability to the account. And so if the account is late, or if the debt is charged off, or if the balance is high, or whatever the issue you may have with the card is, then the primary card holder also has that issue. So if you dispute the validity of a charge off and the item is not verified and you're doing it directly with the card issuer, they've got to send out notices to everybody and have that deleted. And obviously if you just dispute it with one of the credit reporting agencies and the credit reporting agency is going to correct it in their system, they will communicate with the other two but I don't know that that's going to lead to any sort of modification of the account with the primary cardholder or, or co-applicant or, or, excuse me, the, the, the individual cardholder. So if you're disputing it with the credit bureau, the answer would be no. If you're disputing it with the original creditor or a debt collector, the answer is possibly or more likely. Um, here's, one, here's one. Here's uh, one. It's good. I sent out a cash to delete. I got a letter back from the creditor saying, thank you for your remittance. However, we are returning your check or direct payment for the following reason. Account is paid in full. 
I have one word for that, Yahtzee. Uh, <laughs> but it's still showing on some reports. I'm a little baffled. We'll check my reports to see if it's being reported. Uh, what, I would give it 30 days. Uh, again, we talked about it. Give it a little bit of time for those to, to catch up. If you get out there around 60 days and it isn't, uh, you, you've got a letter here saying it's paid in full from the creditor. So now you'd all you'd have to do is create a letter, send that to the credit bureau and say, they say it's paid in full, would you mind fixing that for me? So that's how I would I have, do it. Uh, I have one another to follow up on that whole 30 days thing. We get we get a lot of questions all the time. When does the 31 days start? When does it start? What am I, what am I doing it from? Um, it says I cut corners and sent my part one, letter one letters non-certified. I got some responses back and some I didn't get back. So now I'm confused when my 31 days is up. What's their well, problem? Well, you have a huge problem. Number one, <laughs> you, have, you have no proof that they got the letter. So you've right. got no 31 days, you got nothing. So yep. hence the reason why if you send P1L1, you have to send it certified mail and you have to have a return receipt. And then what would have happened is, um, that creditor or debt collector would have gotten that letter on the 15th, let's say, and that's when the clock starts. And that's uh, calendar days. It's not, um, it's not working days. So it's not Monday through Friday. You're counting every day. And sometimes we get asked, well, what about holidays? Well, you're counting those too. So on that, 30, on that 31st day, on that 30th day of the 31st day, then that's when they would have had to mark that account disputed. So basically, you got nothing. Um, so All right, it, and you can say, you know, that she says, okay, well, I got some of the letters. Some of them responded. Okay, they responded, but did they respond right away, or did they let that letter set for two weeks before they well, responded? Oh no, when that thirty days is up. Yeah, and and how did they respond? What did they say? Uh, I've always said it really doesn't matter much as far as I'm concerned. I don't care. I'm watching to see if they yeah, market. Right. Yeah, that's what, that's what I want. That's a sweet yeah. spot. That's. That's where I'm shooting my arrow, man. I'm shooting for that bullseye that they don't market dispute it. Because if let it's me, a deck, let, 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 let me read you the language from the statute. Um, procedures in case of disputed accuracy, blah, 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 before the end of the 30 day period, beginning on the date on which the agency receives the notice of the dispute from the consumer. There you go. So that's when that's the clock the starts. Bingo. So if it was me and I were in your shoes, I would call the bureaus, I would remove any and all disputes, and I'd start over doing it the right way. Um, because if not, you're already behind the eight ball. Uh, you got nothing. You, see, remember, you're setting up a paper trail here so that you can go to the CFP and say, look, I sent this letter on such and such a date. They delivered on this date. They had 30 days. And there's my proof. And they didn't do it. I checked my credit report. They didn't mark it as disputed. You got them. Now you take that, that's evidence, and now you can start filing complaints and you can start exposing them. But if you have a letter, they can't, you got nothing. I'm sorry, but you know, uh, you, you, I know some people go, well, it's expensive, it's this and that. Well, how much is it gonna cost you if you don't fix your credit? Mm -hmm. Let's look, let's get to some contrast here. How much do you wanna mm -hmm. spend for your insurance? How much do you wanna spend for all those things? So I've always said, I teach this guys, man, this is an investment in your future. Um, I, I, I look at that book, that little book today, and I go, man, that's worth a million dollars to me. That's what it's been worth to me. And, and it's worth similar to you guys. So just do it the right way the first time. What do they say? If you don't have the right enough time to do it right the first time, how are you going to find enough time to do it right the second time? So, it's, it's, it's dirt cheap to fix your credit now versus down the line when you're trying to buy a car, a house, or anything. You just pay more money for it. If you have better credit, you're just paying more money. So it is really their treat. All right, here's another one. We're going to get this one. It says, I have read the syntax regarding bankruptcy several times, followed it, followed all the steps. Now, when they say followed all the steps, I always go, are you sure you followed all the steps? Because I need to know. <laughs> all three reports keep coming back saying verified. I have sent letters to the CEOs of the credit bureaus and filed complaints. Well, okay, so that's there's a red flag. We're in the process that it say that you send... Uh, letters to the CEOs of the credit bureaus and filed complaints. So when you say file complaints, I'm assuming CFBBB and AGs. Still coming back as verified, not sure what to do next. So here's the bottom line. Guys, you got it. That syntax is real. You got you got to freeze all five data mining companies. You've got to uh, suppress LexisNexis. We're finding out now too that you've got to probably suppress ARS. 
Uh, you want to dispute it with Le LexisNexis because you want LexisNexis to send you a letter that says, we're not reporting your bankruptcy or your judgment or whatever. Um, and then you want that letter from the bankruptcy court that says, we don't report information uh, to the credit bureaus. Then once all that's in line and you have everything set up, everything's frozen, everything's suppressed, you have your letter from LexisNexis, you have your letter from the bankruptcy court, then and only then do you dispute it with P2L1 to the creditors themselves. So that part is there. Now, if they come back, you've got a letter from LexisNexis that says they're not reporting it or it's not part of their data bank. And, and the credit bureau says, oh, we, we verified it with LexisNexis. Well, show that to a judge. <laughs> I don't know, Your Honor. They said they talked to LexisNexis. LexisNexis said they're not reporting it. How do you want to answer that? See what I mean? You're boxing them in because they're only, they can only say so much here. They can't say they verified it with the court because they don't talk to the court. Um, they can use PACER, but here's, a, here's an interesting thing. Here's the argument on PACER. Who data entry that information? Are you 100% sure, Mr. Equifax, that PACER, that the information that is in PACER is 100% true and correct? That's my question. So how do you answer that? Well, the answer is they can't. They can't say because they're not at PACER. They don't, they'd have to go pull the employee who got the information and data entry it into the PACER system. So again, that becomes third party that's not going to fly. So, you know, from that standpoint, just understand that's kind of where you guys are with all that. Uh, let me see here. Um, well, I have, I have one for you. So uh, I've sent letters to Experian about deleting my negative accounts. And they sent me a letter stating that if you don't like how we handle our disputes, you can contact the furnisher. What does that mean? Well, um, well first of all, what, what letter is that? What, 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 huh? I'm sorry, I don't understand. <laughs> I don't, I don't understand that. Like that's like a do we? <laughs> yeah, so, um, no guys, did they, don't. Mark, did they mark it as disputed? Did they do what they were supposed to by law? That would be my Yeah, answer. we need a little bit more information. No. Yeah, so. and that's another thing, you guys. When you post your questions and you're bringing them to the table here for me and Jen and 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 Steph and, and Steve and Ebony and, and Leon and Britt and Erica and John and all of us, we need details. You got to tell us what you did. On such and such a date, I sent this letter. On such and such a date, they responded to this letter. On such and such a date, this didn't happen or that happened. I'm kind of in a place, I don't know exactly what to do. But if you say, well, I sent P1L1 and they responded, what do I do next? That tells me you're clueless. I'm sorry, but that tells me that you don't know. You haven't read the book, or at least you're not at a point of a knowledge level that you should know exactly. You shouldn't be sending out P1L1 unless you know exactly what you're going to do next. They're either going to respond or they're not. Those are the two choices. And then if they respond, if they're a debt collector, well, they're responding with what? They're, they're responding with speculation and hearsay. Why? Because they, they don't have any firsthand information. They don't have any witnesses. So they're just throwing photocopies that they got from the alleged creditor, and they're throwing at you, trying to make it look to you that they verified or validated your debt, and they didn't do that. They can't. It's physically mm -hmm. impossible for them to do that. So mm -hmm. now all it is, and that's why we're saying, I don't care what they say. It doesn't matter to me. Bottom line is I'm looking at, man, I've got laser focus on watching, did they mark it disputed? And then if you go in the book, guess what? Your next letter, P1, L2, A or B, tells you exactly in the header which letter to use. They responded, you use this letter. If they didn't respond, you use that letter. And then you go on to the next letters from there. So it's really chronological. It's very simple mm -hmm. to follow, you guys. Mm -hmm. Can you guys see the questions? Let me see. I can't, I can't see them from my iPad here. Yeah, we, we got them for you. All right. <laughs> I, think we have, I think we have enough time for, let's say, three or four more, and then we're, we're going to wrap up this well, webinar. Here's another one. If, I, if you have a credit repair company uh, disputing your, uh, you've hired a credit repair company to dispute your negative account for the past seven months, and they do it via online and mailing letters, does disputing online moving forward revoke my rights? Good. Absolutely. Um, that's, that's why we tell you very specifically, do not dispute online. Do not dispute my fax machine. Don't call them on the phone. Those are three very big no-nos. 
So yeah. now, in their defense, they didn't know this, right? They hired this company. This company said, blah, 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 we can do this, we can do that. Probably made a lot of false promises, and they went at it. Um, and so, again, that's really not your fault because you didn't know. So what I would do is if you buy this book, as you can see, you know, there's thousands of testimonials here. Our, this process works. So what I would do, I would get, if you're asking to get out of from that um, credit repair company, uh, then get out, shut them down, tell them no, that you don't want them to do anything. Then you can call the bureaus, cancel all the disputes. Once all the disputes have been removed, then you can come back with this process and start from scratch. Mm -hmm. You have to call to cancel the disputes. It's not something you do via letter, correct? Mm -hmm. You could you could send a letter if you wanted to, but I'm going to expedite it quicker, Erica. I'm going to call them and say, hey, I have a dispute. I want all the disputes removed. And if they try to argue, oh, by the way, when you call in and you're talking with the uh, credit bureaus, when you call them, make sure you have the call transferred to America, America, uh, because what's going to happen is that call is <laughs> going to get transferred and you're going to talk to somebody. And I'm not, it, I, there's no disrespect here, but you're going to be talking to someone in a foreign country that may not have very good English and they're hard to understand. <laughs> you're already frustrated. You don't want to deal with it. So just make sure that you have the call transferred uh, to uh, someone in America so you can um, understand what they're saying. And if you want to take it to the next level, transfer it to a supervisor, and now you can probably get somewhere. So yeah, just make sure that all the disputes are removed. And if they want to argue with you, say, no, I want them removed. I'm going to go apply for a mortgage. Those disputes have to be removed or I'm going to be denied. And if you're going to get in the way of my denial and my family buying a new home, you know, that would probably cause a legal lawsuit because you're damaging me and my family. Remove the disputes, please. Mm -hmm. Right. And once you say, oh, they're going to go, uh oh, yeah, we better, you know, because they're trained. These guys know if, if, hey, if you get a call and they say this, you tell them, oh, OK, we're going to do that. So they're trained. They know if you say the right thing, um, they're, they're going to remove the disputes for you. And if you want to get a mortgage, they know you're going to be denied if they don't remove those disputes. Mm -hmm. So here's one that, that I see a lot sometimes, and, and I don't know if people get the, the organizations mixed up or the letters mixed up, but um, Kathleen uh, had disputing a, a, a bill with Verizon. And Verizon said that according to the FDCPA, a creditor collecting its own debt is not a debt collector, and any request for debt validation pursuant to section 15 US USC 1692G of the FDCPA is therefore not applicable to Verizon. So what did they do in this situation? Yeah, well, if they're collecting a debt, they're a debt collector. I know. And so the big boys, the big boys go, look, these people are really dumb. And that, you know, so they'll believe anything we'll tell them. So if Verizon says this then, mm -hmm. oh, well, then we're supposed to go, oh, okay, well, that's what they said, so let me go on my way. No, uh -uh, I don't think so. Um, bottom line is uh, Verizon uses that. Uh, there's a couple of others that uh, do that as well. Look, you can't have the corporation, if the debt gets written off, there's certain uh, general accounting practices and principles that they have to follow. So that means once the debt is written off and they take the tax break on it, now that's, that goes over here. And to say that we're still collecting on it, you can't do that. So they're going to have to give it over to, even if it's an in-house collection with Verizon or um, uh, First Premier is, is uh, known for this as well. Uh, you know, again, don't believe them. How can you tell if any debt collector is lying? Their lips are moving. So just go with that and just send the next letter and stay in their face and watch what happens. The next process would be to just keep sending the letters in the way that they're supposed to go. Exactly. Exactly. Did they market disputed? We're back to the square one, right? Did they market disputed? And I don't care. Is there another one? Let's see. Um, what is this one? Uh, how can you find out when a creditor received a certified letter from you? Um, that's a really good question. There's two ways. Number one, you're going to get the green card back. But if you if you want to chase it, here's go to the USPS website. You have your certified mail receipt. It's got the certified mail number on it. All you have to do is go on uh, to their website, enter in um, the certified mail receipt number, and it'll track it for you. It'll tell you where it is. It's been delivered. It's en route. 
whatever, and you can get that right from the USPS uh, uh, website. I used to actually, uh, once it was delivered, I would screenshot that, and I had that, and I had my green card, but I'm just a little anal in that way. <laughs> Imagine that. What is, what is the timeline for Lexus, ne Lexus Nexus to send you back a response after you dispute a bankruptcy with them? They signed for part two, letter one, on 8-4-18. Yeah, 30 days, just like everybody else. Okay. Some yeah. some people heard that it's 45, so it's still 30. Well, it would be 45 if you're redisputing it. So that's how that, that, that buys them time. And that's why, okay. that's why the, you know, Jen and I and everybody says, no, man, don't call them. Don't do that. Because the law has changed when you do that. When you're doing letters, they have to comply a certain a certain way. So I guess, and again, unless it's being re-disputed, they have 30 days. Another Lexus Nexus question: What is the difference between a freeze and a suppress? Uh, there's two levels of information provided through Lexus Nexus. So there's different levels. You're you're freezing the account and you're suppressing the account. So basically, once you're suppressing it, you're basically telling them that they can't communicate. Let me back up. So when they freeze the account. What happens is, is that they can't, and I think John may chime in here on this, you might know a little more, but when you freeze it, you're just saying, look, uh, John's car lot uh, can't get information from me, uh, Susie's home repair can't get, uh, Verizon can't get information, so there's certain creditor, the creditors freeze, they can't get any information. When you suppress it, then you're suppressing everything. That means that... Um, you know, uh, Equifax and Experian and all the big companies and other data mining companies, they can't get the information as well. So you want both. Trust me, you want both. Just roll with that. Makes sense. Uh, so I think we have time for, coming up on 9.15 here, we have time for two more questions and then we'll go ahead and uh, wrap up this webinar for this evening. Um, so what else, what else can you guys see on this? Any good questions you have? Make the last two pretty good. Uh, Jenny says that she recently had uh, paid a collection debt from a creditor. It had gone to legal, so paid it all off. Now the creditor comes back saying that I have a balance after the judgment has already been settled. What should she do? Well, you, you got to love these debt collectors. They'll try anything, you know. And, some, and here's the interesting thing. Some people would pay that. Uh, it's been settled. It's been adjudicated. It's over. Res judicata folks that means it's over it's done so you can tell the debt collector uh to pound sand my question would be it, are they reporting on your credit report and so if you have uh you know obviously it's already been settled so if it's been settled then all you have to do is take the proof of that and and uh send them a letter and tell them to go pound sand if you have to dispute it separately because it's being reported then you can do that too but if it's been settled you know, again, that you're creating all that evidence that you can go file all those uh, complaints with the BB, the CFPB, and the AGs as well. AGs meaning the Attorney General. Cool. Cool. All right. Just one last question here. Let's see what, what you got, Erica. Or Dave. Uh, other than Lexus Ness, I can't say that. Word. Lexus, other than Lexus. Lexus. <laughs> <laughs> what other credit reporting agency furnishes public record information to the three credit bureaus, specifically bankruptcies? Who? So other well, than Lex Lexus Nexus, um, another top one or two. Well, you have um, you have ARS, um, you have uh, Sage Stream, uh, you have the ones that are outlined in the book. There's five of them there, in addition to okay. Lexus Nexus. Those are the ones, and they're all a little different. Um, so, you know, like LexisNexis does bankruptcies. I think SageStream did um, tax liens and judgments. So they all have their own little specialty, their little uh, uh, kind of a thing. Um, but at the end of the day, the only time you need to really get into those, I mean, there, there's no reason for those guys to report anything. So if you want to freeze them, freeze them. I don't see any upside to those guys having your information and reporting it. Um, because they're going to run, they're going to run the big three anyway, for a car or a credit card or or a mortgage. I don't think the mortgage companies, and I and I I say this, I don't think I I'm not 100% sure on this from the standpoint that if they're running a mortgage, that they're going to be using anybody other than the three major credit reporting agencies. So 
I, yeah, freeze them. Makes sense. Makes sense. Okay, so I guess we'll wrap this webinar up tonight. Um, we'll be back on two weeks from now. I'm not sure the date right now. I'm, look, I'm not looking at the calendar. Um, so I want to thank Erica for stopping in today, answering some questions. Dave, as always, and my man John, as always, too. So It should be uh, uh, September 12th. September 12th? You're so efficient. <laughs> You're so efficient. <laughs> All right, well, I guess that, this is it then. You guys have a good night then. Thank right? you, guys. Thank okay, you, guys. Bye. Bye. Stay awesome. Bye. In the Stay face. Up.